start recording. These are super important for those of you watching the recording. Figure these out. Okay. The next big part are these two big slides that we ended with really, really quickly on Tuesday. These summarize everything in chapter 8 and chapter, whatever the next one is, 9. Okay. So this slide and this slide, chapter 8 and chapter 9, is done. Any questions? Good, let's do the exam Monday. Okay. You have to know all of these things. Okay. You have to know all of these things. Okay. And it's not just, a, oh, SN1 means I'm looking at tertiary being greater than secondary. What does that mean? Why is that relevant? Understanding the why behind each of these kind of memorization aspects is what's going to allow you to succeed in organic chemistry both this semester and if you have to carry it through in the second semester. Because in second semester, we take these same reactions and we start stacking and making them more and more complicated, doing more and more different things. Okay. So if you just spend the time to memorize with this, you will probably be fine this semester. It'll be rough. It'll suck more than it already has, okay? But then second semester will become complete and utter hell, okay? So spend the time to understand why these things are happening, okay? And that's what we're going to be talking about when we look at chapter 8 and chapter 9, okay? So substitution. For those of you in the lab, we've already kind of talked about this, okay? Both in the lab packet, which I might have posted online, okay? Let's look at our reaction. What changed? Don't all jump in at once. What's that? Placement of the electrons. Okay. Placement of our electrons. That's getting really specific to what's happening within this, which is good. Take a step back. Chlorine and the iodine swapped. So now we've gone too far back. I want a little bit closer in. What had to happen for the chlorine and the iodine to swap? Okay, which is now kind of the average between your answer and your answer. We broke the bond between the carbon and the iodide, and we formed the bond between the carbon and the chlorine. So in this reaction that may look crazy, there may be tons of other things happening within this structure, or lots of other pieces drawn on. The only thing that has changed is right here and right here. What happens if I add a phenyl ring out here? Did the chemistry change? No. The chemistry is still there. Right? If I want to then ask how does the chemistry change or how much does it change, that's a different question, and now we can start to evaluate the larger structure. Okay. So when we're looking at these pieces, we have to look at them, find where the chemistry changed, focus only at that point. The rest of it is white noise there only to confuse you. Okay. So two things happened. Okay. We have heads, we have tails. What are the possible ways that we could get those two things to happen? Monday should be able to jump out on this. Make and break the bond. And then so we could then break. break and make the bond. Okay. Make. Meaning they're happening at the same time. Or we could break, then break. Then make. Break, then make. meaning not at the same time, so these are different steps. These would be the different mechanistic steps that we just walked through with that big, long quiz question. Okay. There's actually a third option. That third option is make, then break. Good statement. Who cares about octets? Those are completely irrelevant to chemistry. We don't need to worry about it. What happens with that last one? Okay. We break the octet rule. Are we allowed to do that? No. Which means life just got simpler. I don't have to worry about that type of mechanism or that type of reaction. There is officially a fourth way to go through and do this, okay, known as homolytic bond cleavage. When we break the bond, the electrons go back to their parent atoms. This generates free radicals 
and that stuff's crazy. Let's worry about that later, not now. So there's two ways to do this. Okay? So we can come up with some acronyms for this, uh, which we will then later update and make much more appropriate. Uh, but for those that stuck around in the Monday lab, we ended up coming up with some fun little acronyms for this. In this case, we broke and boke. So we have the BAM mechanism. In either case, we broke then moke. We have our BTM. Well, BTM looked like bite me to me. So we have bite me mechanism and we have the BAM mechanism. Okay? Acknowledging the steps that are happening within those. Okay? Yes, that is not official. Don't go around quoting that. But it does make studying organic a little more fun. You can be like, no, that's bite me. Okay. It'll be awesome in the tutoring center. Okay. Make sense? So we now want to address what those each, each of those types of mechanisms are doing. Okay. If we went through and looked at an elimination reaction, so we will now address this part of it. What things changed here? What if we got rid of one of those pieces in the substitution? When we looked at the substitution, we had this chloride. What did the chloride do in that reaction? Replace the iodide. How? What is the chloride good at being able to do? Take electrons? The chlorine can take more electrons? No. What can it do with those electrons? It can share those electrons. That species happens to be a pretty good Lewis base, which could potentially mean it's a Bronsted base. Is it a Bronsted base? What's our definition of Bronsted base? Accepting, hydrogen. Accepting hydrogens. Can chloride accept hydrogen? Yeah. And what's the and? Uh, then you form HCl. And HCl, by definition, strong acid, which doesn't form. Can chloride accept protons? No. no. Can it be a Bronsted base? No. no. So it's not a Lewis base. Or sorry, it's a Lewis base, but not a Bronsted base. If we want to get more specific, we could call it a... Nucleophile. So when we ran the substitution reaction, we had two pieces. Okay. Something on our left reacts with our nucleophile, and we end with two pieces. What happens when we run the elimination? What happens if I get rid of the nucleophile? Okay. Black box. There's nothing there now. Okay. Is that going to change the reaction? Yeah, it should. There's nothing to make a bond. Right? So what things changed in this case? We created a pi bond. So there's some focusing. I like it. There's a creation of a pi bond there. What else did we do? We broke a bond between the carbon and the X. Is that it? And I heard charge. I see charge on the X. I see what you're referencing. Um, that's just the X taking the electrons. So kind of hand wave our way through that by sh saying we broke that bond, we generating the charge. We also lost a hydrogen. Is this mechanism or this explanation now going to be more complex than the first one? Yeah. Why? How many things are happening in the previous one? I said two for the last one. How many things are happening here? Three? Really? Oops, I should draw that the other way. Is making the pi bond something that necessarily happened? Yeah. It's a resonance structure. Do I have to make the pi bond? No. no. So let's ignore the formation of the pi bond, because if I break the hydrogen and the X bonds correctly, I can end up with this resonance structure, and that resonance structure, for all intents and purposes, is the same thing as a pi bond, in which case I didn't actually make a pi bond. Okay. When we're trying to decide, is the reaction an elimination versus a substitution? Yes, we need to see the pi bond formation. When we're looking at how that reaction occurs, the pi bond formation isn't as important. In fact, I would argue is irrelevant. 
which then means in the course of this reaction, only two things happen. Okay? We break the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen, and we break the bond between the carbon and X. So with only two things happening, what's going to then come out of this when we look at our mechanistic steps? We're going to end up with the same three types of options. Okay? We can break the bond between X and our carbon. Then we can break the carbon-hydrogen bond. Or we can break the X bond with our carbon and the carbon-hydrogen bond at the same time. Or we could break the carbon-hydrogen and then have X leave. Okay? Are any of those invalid? Unfortunately not. All of those are perfectly valid. Are any of those questionable? Three. Good. Think came up with patterns eliminating these, right? Ah, that was supposed to be funny. Okay, why is three not a very likely thing to do? It has nothing to do with X, actually. It has to do with the carbon, right? Kind of. X is taking the electrons as our leaving group, okay? So X should be a good leaving group, which means it needs to take electrons, which means it's electronegative, okay? Better than carbon, come on, reconnect. Or more so than carbon, which means that bond is primed to do what? Break. It's ready to go. What about the carbon-hydrogen bond? Why is it not ready to go? Why are they happy together? The electronegativities are so similar that what do we actually refer to the carbon-hydrogen bond as? Nonpolar covalent. It has zero chemistry. That's why it's a nonpolar covalent bond. Is it likely to do the thing with zero chemistry before the thing with chemistry? Why not? All of our reactions are trying to stabilize something. If it's already neutral and unreactive, it's not going to start to react. Something about it has to already be present to be reactive. So step three doesn't happen. So in our elimination, we have two types of reactions. In our substitution, we have two types of reactions. Okay? In the substitution, we refer to them as bite me and bam. For the elimination, we don't really have fancy names. If we go back and look at our summary slides, for the substitution, we have SN1 and SN2, meaning two types of reactions. For the elimination, E1 and E2, because there are two types of conditions that will facilitate those. Okay. Ideally, we would look at those processes of just deciding make and break, and since the elimination has it nicer, look at our options and say, okay, let's test these and hope that only one of those mechanisms was valid. Why do we hope only one is valid? It makes it easier. Okay. Chemistry didn't go easy for us. Certain conditions will favor the first type. Certain conditions will favor the second type. No conditions will favor the third type because we're reacting something that was already stable. Okay. So it's a question now of what things affect each of those to shuttle us to different points. This is where looking at the mechanisms, our elementary reactions from Chapter 7 comes into play because what we now need to do is take those words that we use to describe the making and breaking of bonds in both the substitution and the elimination add curved arrows to those drawings to come up with a full-on mechanism. Once we have the full-on mechanism, we could potentially evaluate energy diagrams. And we could potentially say, okay, what's going to happen if I change this part? How does that change my energy diagram? Does that make the reaction have less of an activation barrier? Sure. What does that mean happens to the speed of that reaction? Less of an activation barrier. It speeds up. What if it becomes more difficult for that reaction? It becomes more endothermic. It's going to take a long time to run that reaction. I can start to come up with predictive abilities, and then we can go into lab and test them. For those of you in lab this semester, 
guess what the lab we're doing this week is? Testing some of those conditions, okay? So that we can verify and see with our own eyes that those conditions do affect the mechanisms, okay? So let's take a look at our simultaneous mechanism, okay? Our SN2 and our E2, okay? So in our previous case, these are our break, then make. So for the substitution, or sorry, break and make. So this was what we'd be calling the BAM mechanism. Okay. I want to break and make at the same time. Okay. So how do I add curved arrows to my diagram for that first one, that substitution, to get from the reactant to the product? What bond needs to be broken? The carbon-bromine bond needs to break. So those electrons have to go somewhere. Where should they go? Why to the bromine? Bromine is more electronegative than carbon, so those electrons are already being pulled that direction, which means the bromine was already partially negative. What's the carbon? Partially positive. So in the future, you may be looking at a reaction, well, I don't know how to predict the product. What's going on with this? Very good first step, find partial charges. Where is there a positive? Where is there a negative? Okay. We just found one, a partial positive and a partial negative, the carbon being partially positive, the bromine being partially negative. To get this reaction to work, what needs to then happen? Our positives and negatives need to somehow exchange. Okay. What did we say was the other bond that needs to happen in this case? The iodine needs to make a bond with the carbon. Okay. Notice that in this format, I showed the sodium as the positive there, okay, and I'm not showing a formal bond between them. Okay. Is that a fair thing to do? What type of bond is there between sodium and iodine? An ionic bond, and in most solvents, that ionic bond dissociates. So our salts tend to generate very weak bonds. You can pretty much ignore metals as long as you acknowledge where the electrons are then going to balance between the metal and whatever it was attached to. Make sense? We've now drawn a mechanism for our substitution. How about for our elimination? Okay. In the elimination, I didn't pick something quite as dramatic as bromine, so let's make that LG into a BR. What's happening now? Bond is breaking. Bond is breaking. Bromine being more electronegative than carbon becomes partially negative. The carbon becomes partially positive. Those electrons need to move towards the bromine. Okay. One of the things that we said was to ignore the middle, so let's ignore that. We said there's no nucleophile. If that bromine takes the electrons and the carbon becomes partially positive. Is that higher or lower in energy? That's higher. That's bad. I need to fix that. How did I fix it in the first case? I added iodide to that positive. I gave it a source of electrons from somewhere else. Is there another source of electrons? The bromine is already taking the electrons, so it's not a bad idea. We could give it right back. Look to the atoms around that carbon. We could take electrons immediately from that other bond. But then what happens? We're generating positives, and we've split the bond structure open. Everything kind of goes haywire. For those of you that can't see that, draw it. Draw exactly what those arrows mean. So that bond isn't the greatest to break. We could go through and try and break this bond. Whoops. Try that again. We could try and break that bond. But then what happens? That bond broke, breaks off, and I end up with CH3 positive. Still more charge. And the whole point was to get rid of charge, minimize charge as much as possible. What's our other option? There's another hydrogen on that carbon. I can take electrons from the hydrogen. Okay. Notice this arrow is different from the arrows that we had drawn up that I had then conveniently erased off the boards. Okay. For our rearrangement, what's happening in this case? <coughs> The electrons between the carbon and the hydrogen 
are now getting moved to a new location. That new location is where? Carbons. Between the two carbons, which then means I have how many electrons between the two carbons? Four. If we think back to our Lewis structures all the way back to unit one, anytime you had a pair of electrons between atoms, what could you draw it as? A line to represent a bond. If we have four electrons, two lines, there's our double bond. What happened to the hydrogen? It goes off as a proton. We might say, well, that is a horrible thing to do. We shouldn't have that floating off on its own. Okay? This, unfortunately, is not true. It is fine to go float off on its own. How do we know that? Okay? Acids. What do acids do? Freely give up protons. Okay? So proton on its own isn't horrible. But is there an issue with the mechanism we've drawn? What did we have to do? we still had to break the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen. Okay. And as we already talked about, is breaking that bond an easy thing to do? Nope. No. Why is it okay to show it happening at the same time as the bromine leaving? As the bromine leaves, that carbon becomes positive. What happens to the electrons in the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen? They gravitate towards the carbon, so the carbon becomes partially negative. The other one, or the hydrogen, becomes partially positive. What have I just done? I took electrons, found my negatives and positives, and I put the negative next to the positive. There's my bond formation. Not still not an easy bond to go through and break. Okay, there's a reason we can break it now, because the bromine is sucking electrons out of the structure. If we tried to make that bond first, there's nothing. The bromine's still present. There's nothing removing the electrons to allow the hydrogen to be broken off first. Okay. So this is all happening at the same time. Can I make that bond easier to break? We could add a more electronegative element somewhere in there. So electronegative that that species would act as a, base. a Bronsted-Lowry base. What would that Bronsted-Lowry base do? Share electrons with the hydrogen. Is that going to cause the electrons in the hydrogen-carbon bond to polarize even further? Yeah, the base starts to bring electrons in. Our electrons are now going to chase the other way away. Okay. And we end up forming that pi bond. So the base can help this reaction along. Yes? So, you know, the base helps it. You don't need the base to get it done because the way the structure works out, the octet is not satisfied and it wants to, and the only way to do that is to the bond. The octet is still satisfied in this mechanism because we've never formally broken any of the bonds. So, when bromine leaves, has the bromine left before yet. we break that bond? But, it, but once it does, I'm saying that once it does leave, Different mechanism. different mechanism. Yep. So you have to be careful. This is happening all at the same time. So we're looking at all of those charges kind of stacking with each other and how do they interact with each other. Okay. So that bromine is helping to initiate and make that hydrogen more positive. A positive hydrogen is known as also coming from an acid. It's making the hydrogen more acidic. Okay. So our base can help come in and help pull the hydrogen off, which can cause this cascade of a reaction to occur. Okay. But the only reason the cascade occurs is because that leaving group has the ability to leave. Okay. If it isn't already leaving, there's no reason to pull the hydrogen off. Okay. So it has to happen simultaneously. Is there another way we could do this? Yes, yes, there is another way. Nope, still dealing with this reaction. What are we trying to do? Okay, an elimination, and it all depended on breaking what? The bond, the carbon-hydrogen bond. Okay. I can break it by having something else come in and force it to break. Is there something else I could do to cause that bond to break? 
What's that? Burn it. Heat it up. What happens when you make that solution hot? What happens to all of the bonds? They vibrate. If we give it enough energy, it vibrates enough that it's now far enough away from the structure that the bond snaps. We initiate the reaction that way. So we could just as easily have supplied heat. So what is our difference now between our substitution reaction and our elimination reaction? One forms the double bond. What's the difference between our substrates? They're the same. That kind of sucks, because you're going to be expected to be able to predict the products. If you look at the substrate, does that help you decide which mechanism to do? No. So what else was different between these? Uh, that's questionable. That only works for the lab, so I'm going to have to erase that. Not a bad idea. The way it was written, yeah. Okay. Looking for the pi bond, but that's if I ask you to predict product, how would you be able to predict? We need to find a difference before we look at the difference in the answer. It's the, it's the difference of solvent or addition of Solvent? Okay, solvent is a possibility, except acetone is a solvent, so I got specific here and I was more generic here. Either case, what do we need? A solvent. So the right idea, wrong answer. Where else is there a difference? This is a Bronsted base because it reacts with hydrogen. What did our iodide act as? As a Lewis base, we can get a little bit more specific than that, as a nucleophile. So if I identify that I have a nucleophile versus a base, I can now say, oh, nucleophile means substitution. substitution. Base means elimination. elimination. What else was a big difference? Okay, I will kind of accept that as an answer up to now. So there's a hint. Let's start erasing the things that we said weren't the same or were the same. Okay, so you already talked about the base. I said the substrate. Oh, crap, is there anything left? What do we have in the elimination? Heat. Why would we potentially need heat? You addressed a very good point. Whoa, wrong button. This is neutral, this is neutral. Is there a difference in energy? No. Yeah, not very much. This is neutral, this is neutral. Is there a difference in energy? No. Someone said yes. The pi bond is higher in energy, which means this reaction is endothermic. How could I speed up an endothermic reaction? Add heat. Heat tends to be a signifier for an elimination reaction because I'm trying to break a very difficult to break bond. Okay. Does that mean if you see heat, it is always elimination? No. Okay, be careful on that. It's just a note. Yeah, yeah it's not an exact science. Okay. But if you see heat, elimination is a good thought process to start kicking with. Uh, questions on what's up there? The other version was going through a stepped process, a then. Okay. So in our starting with our substrate, okay, if we're going to go stepped, what happens? I need to break the bond first in both cases. So I break that bond, what do I get? What's the product of that broken bond? I think I heard one thing. Okay. Two things. Not only two things, but two ions, two negative ions. Let's address that for a second here. Okay. What do you mean two negative ions? So the chloride we'll ignore because I didn't do anything. Okay. What is the charge on this species, our starting material? It's neutral. So what does the charge of our product need to be? Neutral. So when you said two negative ions, you saw the chloride? Okay, just checking. So is this structure drawn correctly? No. What's wrong with it? We need the positive charge. That positive charge will haunt you. It's 
typically easy to find the negative because what are you showing the motion of? Electrons. Okay, you have to remember the electrons came from somewhere. There's now a position lacking them. Okay, what did we do in that first step? Broke a bond, mechanistically known as heterolysis. Okay, we now have two options from that. Once we break that bond, we can either make a bond, in which case we can now bring in our chloride, and what does that chloride need to do as a negative? Make a bond by sharing electrons between which two atoms? Carbon and the chlorine. Give me more information. The positive carbon and the negative chlorine. Your charges, opposite charges, will attract. Find the negative, find the positive, put them together. And we end up doing our substitution reaction, our stepped substitution reaction. What was the other pathway that we could have done? We could try to remove the hydrogen. Okay. Why is that hydrogen now easier to remove than it was in the previous system of reactions? Once we remove the iodine, what do we end up with? Positive a charge. So when we think about induction, we're typically referencing electronegative elements. Positive charge isn't and really electronegative. But it is a location that is missing electrons. Okay? Why would we remove the hydrogen? I can take those electrons to stabilize the positive charge. Again, I'm finding a source of electrons and a place that lacks them, and I'm doing whatever I can to neutralize that. So that bond now becomes much easier to break because I have a positive charge. With the iodine still attached, there's no formal positive charge. That becomes more difficult to go through and break. Okay. I can now do my elimination reaction and end up with my final product. If I wanted to, I could show the electrons go to the carbon first to form the anion. We typically don't do that because that structure is the bad Lewis structure, right? Because we have charges and we're missing an octet. We would typically draw directly to the alkene product. Okay. While it is easier to break, I want to help that happen. How could I help that happen? Heat. Heat. Interestingly enough, we don't add a base. Okay. In the stepped version of our elimination, the presence of a base becomes an issue. What happens if we add a base? The presence of a base gets us the other mechanism. So as soon as we add a base, even in the stepped situation, we're going to end up shuttling a different mechanism. So we can't add a base in the stepped elimination. The only thing we can really do is add heat. The presence of a strong base will push us to the other mechanism. Okay. So we've already started to evaluate different things or signifiers that we could start to look for and differentiate between these. Heat was a big one. Bases versus nucleophiles was a big one. Someone mentioned sub or substitution, mentioned solvents. We didn't talk about the specifics of solvents, but the solvent comes into play. What else could we potentially look at? Electronegativity of what? Okay, nucleophile versus our base we already talked about, but you did just address the next one. The leaving group. Notice here, what did I eliminate or what took the electrons? Iodine. Why did it, was it not carbon or the other hydrogen on that carbon? Iodine is more electronegative. So we can look at the ability of the leaving group. We actually already talked about that without even knowing it. The iodine should take the electrons because it's more electronegative. So I can now look at the leaving group. What else is going to become a factor? In this very first, do I have it nicely drawn? I do. What did I generate? A positive charge. Is that a stable thing? No. No. What if I change the structure to make sure that becomes more stable? How likely is it going to be that this mechanism holds true? 
it's stable, then you're going to say it's staying as is. But is it, I'm not making it permanently stable, I'm making it more stable. How likely would it be to run the stepped mechanism then, if I make this intermediate more stable? Right, what happens if I make it less stable? You're saying more likely to happen. Look at our energy diagram, number two, one to two. Okay. If I raise the energy of two, what happens to the likelihood of making it to five? Becomes less likely. You're making a mistake by looking at the energy of the carbocation and now referencing where it goes after it's formed. If that cation is unstable, does it ever form? No. To get this mechanism to happen, what needs to happen? I have to have a stable carbocation. Otherwise, what happens to the first step? It never happens. Okay? You have to look at the whole picture and each of those stages. Okay? So if I can make the cation more stable, I increase the likelihood that the first step happens. I may decrease the likelihood of the second step. Does that matter? Why not? Which of these steps is going to happen the fastest? The first step or the second step? Which of those is going to happen the fastest? Start with our energy of our reactant. Call this an intermediate. Call this product. What's the energy of our intermediate, higher or lower than our reactant? Higher because? Charged. What's the energy of our product? Lower than the intermediate. Okay. So let's even just say it's overall an endothermic reaction. Which of those steps takes the longest, the first one or the second one? First one because? Highest activation energy. Even if that product is a higher in energy, that intermediate formation is the slow step. That's the first step. The first step dictates the speed of this reaction because it is the slowest. Do I care how fast the second step is? No, because it by definition will be faster by far than the first step. So even if that cation is more stable and we decrease the speed of the next step, it's still faster than the first step. Okay? So you now have the basics of each of those mechanisms. What you now want to go through and do is consider what things change. What happens if I change the nucleophile? What happens if I change that substrate? Where does this make an effect? How does that push me to a different mechanism over the other? Okay. It is not particularly easy, but it comes back to slowly reasoning your way through those structural effects. The lab does help, and we'll pick up again wherever Monday we go through and look at this. I guess the last thing I'll talk about, do we care about which mechanism? Well, yeah, because the mechanism changes, what happens? Products change, okay? So that is going to become important. Philosophically, absolutely going to be important because we want to know how things work. The more we know about how it works, the more likely we can change it or make it better, okay? So we'll pick up, uh, ooh, lovely, with that, with 152.